While backups are an important part of your strategy for keeping your data safe, real-time file synchronization can also be an added part of that protection strategy. Having files automatically synced across all your devices each time you change them has a lot of other benefits as well. My favorite tool for doing this is SyncThing, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. SyncThing is a fully open source, real-time file synchronization tool that I've been using for over eight years now. It supports Windows, Mac, and Linux, Android, and there's also a third-party app called Mobius for iPhone. Docker support is provided by the team over at linuxserver.io. There is no concept to client server with SyncThing. All systems running SyncThing are called devices. The protocol uses encrypted using TLS encryption, and by default, devices that connect to each other require explicit approval. File conflicts are handled with the older file being renamed with a sync conflict suffix. We'll talk about that in the video. There's also file versioning option that are set up per folder and per device basis. The project does offer free use of their public relay servers to get remote systems connected, but that can be turned off and devices can be connected manually, which I will be showing in this video. Since there's no central server or requirement that you connect to their servers, this makes SyncThing a very ideal app for people who are concerned about privacy or maintaining control over their data, which is why I like SyncThing. So let's get started with the tutorial of how to set it up, how to get it syncing, and how not to have to use their servers, but cool that they're there if you want to use them because it doesn't really give them any data besides your IP address. Let's get started. <music> I want to start with a few different scenarios that you can use SyncThing in and a couple different configurations. SyncThing has, as I said in the beginning, no concept of client server. Each device is just that, a device. We pick a folder that we want to share with other devices. And those devices can be set up one-to-one. -one. They can be set up essentially in a mesh mode. For example, I have this Android phone synchronizing to two different systems. And you can, let's say, have a shared folder where it syncs to all of them and then can even go out across the public internet. Because the transport layer itself is encrypted, you could use this protocol publicly, or you could set up a VPN and port forwarding. There's a few different scenarios here. I'm showing this is more the way I use it because I implicitly list things and I don't use their relay servers, but there are options by which you can. Now, another scenario, very similar as well as TrueNAS. I'm not going to cover how to set it up on TrueNAS in this particular video. That'll be a separate tutorial. But in TrueNAS, you can use SyncThing. I like it being on my server because it has lots of storage and lots of space. And it really lends itself well to running on a NAS. And I usually have my computer, which is a laptop that's not always on, but always synchronizing to TrueNAS. That way, other devices that I have that are remote always are syncing as well because this is the system that's on all the time is my TrueNAS. So as I turn on and off my desktop or laptop computers, I know those file saves are going right to TrueNAS, which is always on, and computers I have at other locations also have access to those files and are synchronized all the time. Now, they do offer relay services. This, of course, means you're going to, and by default, these are turned on, they're really easy to turn off, allow you to contact the relay servers, not for any reason to host your files, but only to connect devices. So there's a dis device discovery protocol. That's why I marked it here in yellow. Green represents the TLS traffic where the file synchronization happens. But the servers that they have will figure out where each device is and use things like UDP hole punching, look for different ways it can get those connections or even relay that connection. Now, like I said, this does not give them any visibility into anything other than the IP addresses and your device name for discovery, but you can completely turn this off and implicitly list things and not use their auto discovery tools. They're optional, but it's cool that they're there and it does make things really convenient for people that are maybe stuck behind that, but they also come with a consequence occasionally if they have to relay, they're not gonna be as fast as a direct connection. So I usually recommend maintaining your own infrastructure, such as a VPN, and a VPN that is a mesh style VPN works really well when you're traveling with it, and that's what I use right now. Another really interesting feature that we'll cover in this video is the untrusted SyncThing server. This is a feature they added a few years ago, but it's really impressive where I can have unencrypted data here and here on my TrueNAS and on my laptop and, and a remote location or any other number of remote locations or other devices. But what if I want to keep a copy in the cloud? What if that's the central place I have me and a coworker where we would like to have a shared space, but we don't trust that location. And this is where untrusted sync thing servers come in. You actually have a password that is stored locally on each one of these devices that are connecting to the untrusted node. This password is the same on every device and the untrusted node has no idea what that password is. All it knows is to synchronize the files. The only thing you really lose when you do this, of course, is you can't recover this without that password. So first you have to always know that password. You'll never get the data back off of here. 
But on the other side, you also lose the revisioning features because it doesn't know what it's revisioning. They did a wonderful job of implementing this protocol. So you can't tell which files are being changed, not even the metadata, not even the name of the file. It breaks everything up into a really interesting way of scattering the files around inside the directory, which we'll show. But it's really a neat idea to be able to have something that I can host on the public internet in an untrusted data center where someone may want to take and have physical access to it, but it wouldn't matter. They have no visibility into the data. The only thing they would learn is that node A and node B are both connecting to it. So not much data can be uh, pulled from it, not even dates. And it's really impressive the protocol they use. They've documented it well. Installing in Windows is really easy. Just download the sync thing setup. Install for current user. Default options are fine. Here's an option if you want to turn off relays, but you can also turn them off later. I would say definitely start automatically. Leave that option. Say yes to configuring the firewall settings. And go ahead and open up sync thing. It doesn't have a normal application window, so it's going to direct you to 127.0.0.1.8384, and you can say yes to the anonymous usage if you want. Now, installing in Linux is relatively easy as well. It's actually in many of the distributions already, but I prefer to load it right from their packages because then you're going to get a newer version of it here. So we're just going to follow these instructions here for a Debian system, works for Ubuntu as well, and uh, just copy and paste them in. First, we make the key rings. Then we're going to paste in the curl command to copy the key ring in. And this command adds it to the app sources list. Then next, we're going to run sudo apt-get update. Then a sudo apt-get install sync thing. Now, sync thing does not start by default. So we want to system control enable now sync thing at lts.service, lts being the user. And now means start that service now. Now, while we do have this installed and running, if you're running a Linux install that is essentially headless, you're just getting in over SSH, this kind of presents a problem because by default, it binds to localhost. There's two different ways you can solve this problem. You could manually edit the config file and sync thing, or if you're SSHing in, you can set up forward. My preferred way is to set up forward so I can forward the local that is bound to the system and bind it then to my system SSHing from. This works fine in Windows. If you're using PuTTY, you can use local remote forwards. If you're using from the command line, the Linux SSH command, the config file is an easy way to add port forwards. So I'll show you how to add that really quick and because it's kind of a nice shortcut and maybe you weren't familiar with the SSH config file. And this process is really simple. Use the editor of your choice. And we want to edit the .ssh config on my system here. So we're going to go in here and we're going to call the host name. In this case, it's LTS Labs Sync Thing 2. I also have a Sync Thing 1. The host name is the IP address to the server, username, port number, local forward. I have 8000 forwarded to 127.0.0.1.8384. And as you notice, that's where by default Sync Thing binds to and the port it binds to. Because I'm also running Sync Thing on my local system, I can't reuse port 8384. So I just made it 8000 because there's nothing on there. That means this local machine that I'm on, when I SSH into it via this host name, SSH LTS Lab Sync Thing 2, it will bring that port over and I can locally access it and then we can start modifying it. And as you can see at the top here, 127.0.0.1.8000. And I'm brought with the default install here, which is, of course, allow anonymous users reporting is the first question. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. And it lets me know that there's no username and password on the UI. So we can fix that by going to settings, UI here. And if you want it to bind to all, we're going to change this to a zero and this to a zero. I highly recommend at the same time that you also put in a password. And we probably want to use HTTPS for the GUI. Now, we kept the port number the same, so nothing I have to do on my end. There's no port forward change I have to do with this SSH. When we do this, though, it'll be accessible by the IP address. So if we hit Save. Then it says our connection is no longer private. Go ahead and continue. And now we're in the system here. Now, I've, this one's called LTS Lab Sync Thing 2. I also have LTS Lab Sync Thing 1. So let's go ahead and continue with the demo from that one. Now that we've installed a Windows instance and a Linux instance, let's talk about actually how to get things synchronized inside of SyncThing. The target is going to be my documents folder. I have some drawings in there. I have a text file I threw in there. And we're going to show you how to get the data from here into SyncThing. And then we'll show how to add other devices. First, you're going to have this default folder. And 
I've also, as I noted, modified the Linux one so I can access it not just by localhost IP. I've let it bind to all the IPs for both Lab Sync Thing 1 and the one we did in the demo, Lab Sync Thing 2. They're set up identically. I just made them different colors to make it a little bit easier to understand. But you'll notice at the top here, it says LTS Lab Sync Thing 2, Sync Thing 1. And then this is Tom's VirtualBox instance running Windows. So each of these is all accessible and they're online and each of them has a default folder, which we're just going to get rid of because I don't use it. I don't care. It's just what it has in there by default. Next, we want to add a folder. The folder we want to do is documents. You want to start on a system that has the known good copy of everything. You could mesh these together with some documents over here and some documents over there type scenario, but you're going to have a harder time sorting it out. So start with your source of truth and source of good documents and then go ahead and give it a folder ID. Tom's documents. The folder ID is randomly generated, but you know, Tom's docs sound good. And folder path, not that one. We want to go ahead and say users slash Tom and we'll say slash documents. You can also hit these pull downs next to it. You have this autocomplete feature essentially where it can see what you have permissions to read and be able to pull down to make sure you're getting the document director right. But we're going to hit save. Now, this is not shared yet, so nothing has really happened. We've just created this as an option to share with other remote devices we attach. Inside these options as well are things like the sharing, where we're going to share it with. We're going to revisit that because there's no devices yet. File versioning, ignored patterns. If you have specific patterns, you do not want be part of the synchronization and an advanced option for other details that will go a little outside of what we need to talk about today, but you can read each of these extended attribute options or ownership options, and they're usually not needed, but maybe you have a special case. These are the options for those special use cases for such as managing permissions. Now, what we want to do is add a remote device. By default, under here, under settings, then under connections, enable NAT traversal, enable global discovery, local discover, and enable relaying. With these options turned on, this enables the global discovery service and allows the devices to find each other even when they're on separate networks or across separate locations behind different IP addresses. So if you just want to add a remote device, we're going to hit add and we need that device's ID. So we'll go over here to this other one and we want to simply show ID. So there's the ID I could share by email. You could scan this QR code with your phone. We just paste in this ID, give the device a name, LTS lab one and hit save. Now, one thing that should be noted, it will not immediately connect to this. You're going to see a connection request come up over here. So we're going to close on this. Then we want to add this remote device because it discovered it. It's going to be called Tom's virtual box because that's the name of the device, but you could also call it something else if you wanted to. I'm just going to leave it the same. I will capitalize virtual box just for reasons. Go ahead and hit save. Now the two devices are disconnected. They take a moment to connect when you have them implicitly listed IP as we show it'll connect a little bit faster. But while we're waiting for that, we're going to go ahead and remove this because I don't need it. So there's no folder shared. We want to go back over here and now this one's connected. Great, but this isn't shared, which means we're going to go ahead and edit this. We're going to sharing. And what devices do you want to share it with? We're going to share it with lab. Now, if it's an untrusted device, we put this password in. We're going to cover that later. For now, this is a trusted device and we want to hit save. And it's going to share Tom's documents from this to this one here. Then over here, we're going to see Tom's virtual box wants to share Tom's documents. All right hit add. Where do you want to save these? By default, it's going to give it the name Tom's Documents on this local system. And I think that's a good name for it. So I'll let that go. Uh, folder ID is fixed. You can't change that, but you can give it a special label. Over here, file versioning. Do we want any file versioning? This is where I usually pick it to run on something like a NAS or a dedicated storage server that's already on all the time because there's a lot more storage available. So I can say, yeah, go ahead and pick different file versioning, such as trash can file versioning. You can say clean out after a number of days. You can even have a special path for different versions or a cleanup interval, or you can choose something like simple file versioning. Just keep five versions of it. Maybe you want to specify a second path. You don't need to. It creates a folder automatically where it saves these revisions so you can find them. 
Uh, you can also get to them through the UI. And if you want, once again, you can set a clean out time in there. They also have staggered or external file versioning, such as running a command that pushes the file somewhere else if you have an advanced use case. There's more documentation that's on the sync thing site. Once again, we have ignored patterns. If we want to add any ignored patterns, then we have those same advanced options on here. Now we'll go back over here to general, click save. Now the system is going to synchronize between here and there. So we're going to take a second because it's accepted the share and it will see the connections, connection type, where it's going using port 22,000. And then after a few moments, it'll all be synchronized. The files are synchronizing over to the other server here. All right, now that everything's fully synced between each one of these devices, let's go ahead and create a new file here. And we'll call this file test2.text. So we have two text documents. Actually, this one has nothing in it. So let's put some data in here. And we'll just say some data, save. And in real time, as this file was created, it will synchronize between all the other devices that it shared with right here. So if we go here to our Linux system and we do an LS, there's the sum file, there's a test2, and there's the draw.io drawings. But now let's talk about conflicts and what happens if there's a conflict. This is the most popular question I get is what if these systems aren't connected? We make a change to the same document. And in this case, we're going to use the test2 document. Uh, we're going to pause the synchronization. We'll hit pause right here on the remote device, the LTS Lab 1. It's paused. Let's go ahead and open this file. And we'll say edited on Windows. So we know we edited this one on the Windows system. So we'll go ahead and uh, close that and save it. And let's do an edit over here. If we go to Vim test two, we'll change this one to edited on Linux. And now we've created a conflict when this saves and we restart the sync. So we'll go ahead and resume. It's going to take a second to reconnect and discover these, and then it will create a file conflict here. Now we see that we have a sync conflict. So here's test two, and it actually brought over the one that was edited from Linux and kept a proper file name. But the other one here, it says UM7BLG5S. You have test two, sync conflict, and this is the one we edited on Windows. There's a condition where it figures out which one it thinks is the most recent, makes it the most recent version, and then leaves the other one a conflict. So because we edited Windows first and edited Linux second, that's technically the newer one. So it's assuming that's the right name for the file, but we didn't want to lose that edit that we did on this side. And the reason it gives it that unique ID on the back, if you'll notice, that is the actual identification number with our Windows one. And since the system is keeping both copies of the file, there's not really any data loss. It's just you are now tasked with sorting out why this was done at the same time. Now let's turn on revisioning. This will allow us to have any changes that were done on another system. We'll have another local version. You can turn it on in each system and you can set a different type for each one. Maybe we want to keep five versions here, but if we're over on a NAS where we have a lot more storage, that device, maybe you want to go in and set the versioning to keep 50 versions. These are controlled on a per device per share basis. So we can have the different versions set up not to necessarily be the same at each node in each device because within the particular share on the device you do the setting is a folder called ST versions that's created. It's a hidden folder. It's not synced between all the devices. That's why this is a per device setting, but you'll actually get a copy of all those different version changes. This can also protect you in a scenario where someone gets a hold of one of your devices and wipes everything out or makes a lot of changes. You can go back and then revert those changes. And as far as reverting the changes, that part's really simple. So first, we're just going to go ahead and delete that because I didn't need it. Uh, we'll delete this one. And maybe we want to edit this one here and change something in it to be Let's test versions and probably spell version right. All right, we save that. Now let's go ahead and give it a second to sync. And we're going to look on one of the other devices, specifically Lab Sync Thing 1, and let's look at the different versions on there. And because I edited this a couple times, you can see each one of the versions that's available in here and we can restore to any one of those. Something of note, I'm seeing these on the 
LTS lab sync thing device. But when you go here, it does not, even though versioning is enabled, allow you to do local version. So if you edited from this system, it's not going to change them. This only is for changes that occurred on other systems. So if we were to edit a file on this device here, that would then create different variations of the file here in the versioning system. Now let's move this to manual mode and not use the global discovery servers. This is the way I operate sync thing because I want to implicitly say where each connection is going. I don't want this beaconing out at all to any external services. So we're going to go here to actions, settings. We're going to go to the connections here. We're going to turn all these off. I've actually already turned them off on the Linux servers. Now I want to point out that as of right now, this is still connected because it was discovered, but when it restarts, it will lose that discovery because if we edit this, you see it says dynamic. Dynamic means any IP address can connect to this or come from this. One side needs to initiate the connection. The other side can actually be left dynamic. So we're actually going to do, because I can assume that these Linux servers here are always going to be at these IP addresses that I set. So we're going to connect it to these servers implicitly. Really easy to do even on an existing connection. We're just going to go to edit and right here under address, we're going to put TCP 10.13 37 176 port 22,000, the default port that sync thing is on. If you were to change any of the ports, of course, you'd have to adjust this accordingly. But now we click save and we can go ahead and restart sync thing to verify this. It not only connects, it connects right away because it doesn't have to go through discovery, finding it. It just knows that this is the IP address that it's at and these things connect immediately. Now, if we want to add a device, we got this other one here we haven't set up yet, this LTS lab sync thing too. Yeah, we can add this device and same thing. We're going to go ahead and show the ID. We're going to copy it, go over here. If you want to add a remote device, put in the device ID. Under advanced, we can't leave it dynamic. We'll put in an IP address of that system there and hit save. Now it says disconnected unused. We go over here and we notice immediately there's an add device and we'll just go ahead and hit save. Now this is fine to be on dynamic because it may be that my computer is coming from different IP addresses. That means the Tom VirtualBox system always has to initiate the connection to this. So it's fine to have one side of it set to dynamic and you'll find that each of these is set that way because the connections initiated from. So if you have something such as a NAS, it's probably fine to leave the NAS be dynamic and have the boxes that may change IP addresses coming in and using the implicit connection. Now, the last scenario I want to go over is having an untrusted sync thing device. Essentially, what you have is each one of these devices running sync thing has a password that allows them to talk to the server. They all have to have the same password. This means any file changed on this would pass through here. This untrusted device would be unaware of anything other than encrypted data being changed. It would know the quantity of files. It would know the size of the file, but not anything else. It doesn't even keep the date within here. All the metadata is essentially scrambled. So it would see the connection coming in. It would synchronize the encryption. And then that encryption would be synchronized to all of these. But because they have the password, they would all have the unencrypted version of all the files. This allows you to have a server that you place in the cloud that you don't have to worry that if someone were to attack that server or gain access to it, they would be able to have access to your data. They only get access at that point to the encrypted data. And the only other thing in this server is going to be the device connections that are coming in. So it would know the IP addresses for all the different devices and the names of those devices, but that's it. So it's a really robust system that they've developed here to keep your data secure and allow you to have a public facing server that's in the cloud, but not one you have to really put your trust in. Now you set up the untrusted devices the same way you set up any other devices, you add them as a connection. The difference is when you go and set up a share. So we already have this one done. Who do we want to share it with? We'll go to sharing and we're going to use LTS lab sync thing too, as our example for an untrusted device, because we haven't shared anything with it yet. And I just put the password in of one, two, three, four, five, six, and we hit save. Now we go over here. And we see it's being offered the Tom's document folder. So it does know the name of the folder, but let's go here and Tom's document. No problem. Go ahead and hit save. And it will synchronize the documents folder, but it's only going to have an encrypted version because of the password we put here. So each subsequent system that we want to have access to this, we can have it attached to it. We just need to simply put that same password in. 
this one right here on each of the systems and they can talk to it. But this system here does not have that password. Therefore, it's only going to have an encrypted copy. I will note that I'm doing this in real time and you may have noticed it didn't seem to receive any documents right away. It does take a minute when you set up the encryption. One of the ways you can speed that up is you can actually force a restart on both sides and it will automatically start doing it. If not, it just kind of pauses here for a moment. That's completely normal. And if you wait, it'll go ahead and start synchronizing or I'll just restart it and restart on this side. And it immediately starts sending all the files and it synchronizes. I'm not sure what causes it to pause like that. I'm just imagining it's some of the way the encryption is done, but you get the idea. All right, and now the system is synchronized. If we look over here, we can see the draw DIO drawings, test two, test three, the documents we were using earlier. Let's see what it looks like on the encrypted server. Okay. There's a whole lot of folders here. So let's go ahead and poke in some of these. What does r.syncthingenc? Well, we have another one called OF. All right. And there's some files. What about the date of the files? And we see it set it to February 13th of 2009. And that name is not recognizable. This is what's great about the way these encrypted servers work. It's completely blind to any of the data. It's going to know, of course, the count of files and the volume of data you have, because you can't really obscure that. I guess it could overinflate the data, but you will be able to derive that information, but not a lot of specific details because they're all encrypted. Matter of fact, interestingly, you can turn on file versioning. So we'll turn on simple file versioning, leave it at five, hit save, and let's go ahead and make some document changes here. So we've got test three. Let's uh, edit that file, save it so it has some data that's changed. We'll open up this one, change some data in that one, hit save. Matter of fact, let's make a new document, some more data, put some data in there. Save it, uh, and let's go ahead and delete this file. Maybe we don't need that one there. Now let's see what type of revisions we have. And we're able to look and see these revisions, that there were some changes here. So this must be that file, but it doesn't seem to be quite related. So I'm not exactly sure as I changed a few things. Maybe there's a couple versions of this file. Oh, well, we do have a couple versions of it. We know the size of the file, but we don't know the file name. So this does a great job of being blind to what any of this data actually is, meaning your data is protected, provided you use a better password than one, two, three, four, five, six. So obviously that might be something someone could guess. So use a high quality password. Your data is quite secure on this system. Now the last thing I want to mention is how I'm using SyncThing. I have my business docs, graphics, LTS log seek was actually an encrypted one, just like I shown there at the end, where under the sharing, we've got a password. This allows us to connect to Lawrence system site and have that system be untrusted. So it runs in the cloud to make it easy when we're remote, no one has to use a VPN to be able to get to this. But if anyone were ever to compromise that server, there would not be any data for them to extract because we keep it all encrypted. So uh, I really love this feature, being able to have these servers where I can keep something in the cloud in an untrusted location and still not have to trust it, but still get the benefits of file synchronization between each device that is connected to it. Now, I also keep it running on my TrueNAS. So I have the TrueNAS R sync thing. This is a local TrueNAS. And there's another remote TrueNAS that I have set up as well. And my main TrueNAS, of course, also syncs to remote TrueNASs to get this all synchronized and have file versions of all of them and then snapshots instead of TrueNAS. I'll do a separate TrueNAS tutorial on this later, but it's pretty easy to set up. And the only system not showing connect right now is my uh, MacBook Air because it's closed and I'm on my main desktop here. But yeah, this works fine with all of them. Also works really well for my phone. Anytime I take a picture or something I want off my phone and I don't want to have to synchronize it or load some utility or copy files out of it, having sync thing on the phone, I have it set to automatically connect only when it's on a certain network and it automatically connects and synchronizes all the photos immediately. So it makes it a lot easier. I have them synchronized with both my SureNAS and my desktop system here. Same thing has just been such an easy way to get all my files and synchronize in real time. And well, I'm not patient and it's nice because this doesn't require any patience. The synchronizations happen within seconds and are cascaded across all the different servers connected. Now, just as I said in the beginning, SyncThing is open source and free and well documented. This was not paid or endorsed by anyone other than 
me. I decided I wanted to make a tutorial on this, so I thought, well, I use it and maybe you'll find it interesting too. Leave your thoughts and comments down below. Like and subscribe if you want to see more content from the channel. Head over to my forums at forums.lawrencesystems.com if you'd like to have a more in-depth discussion on this and other topics. And I'll leave links to the things I mentioned, such as the same thing documentation, right down below in the description. And thanks.